Hello and welcome to Give Me the Remote. It's the 8th of January 2019 and we're on episode 28. I'm Sheridan and I'm joined by my co-host John. Hello folks, how are we doing today? So back into the new year and there's been quite a lot of content being jammed down our throats by Netflix. Mm, And others. And others, but... And it's the first podcast of the year, so I think we owe a Happy New Year to our listeners. We do. Happy New Year. (laughs) So, if you have Facebook, or probably any other kind of social media, I think you'll have realised that almost every single person you know has watched Bird Box. Well, in which case, it's kind of pointless us reviewing it. We should just move on. But people might be interested in their thoughts. No, I know, I know. I think, and I think lots of people haven't watched Bird Box yet, but definitely Netflix has been promoting the hell out of it because it's a A A-list original movie. It is. Straight to Netflix. Mm Mm-hmm. For reasons we'll discuss. Yes. Mm. Um, So Netflix, who never, ever talk about their viewers, decided that they couldn't help themselves and tweeted that, they got 45 million viewers for this movie in its first week, mm. which is a lot of people. Which, But in terms of the economics of the business, um, in ye olde days, the nut would have been maybe five bucks per ticket on that. And if they got 45 million, then that's um, 20 million opening box office nut. Um, if you're talking opening receipts, then it's 45 times 16. Um, point being... Back in the days when you sold a ticket for a movie, 45 million was a lot of people to watch it. But in the days when everyone's just on a subscription, uh, yes, it means lots of people watch the movie on your service, but there's no actual additional revenue based on that. It's just a cost. True, but the Netflix model actually requires them to produce these kinds of viral movies yeah. because that's how they retain subscriptions. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I get that. And you know, this, this subscription revenue is huge. but it's And just... they're at the point now, too, where they're... They've prob- they've saturated the market. Like they have probably the n- this number of sus- subscribers they're going to have. Oh, so they they're telling Wall Street rough, they think they roughly. can find some more. But I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, in the countries they're in, they probably mm. have the number they're going to have. So now their goal is just to retain those numbers, and they need to do that by having these high profile movies. Um, yeah, indeed. But I, I brought up box office simply because um, this would have been a marquee movie. A year ago, definitely two years ago, and now it's a straight to digital release, and even that on a very cheap freebie service digital release. It isn't like this is holding up the temp pole on an HBO subscription. True, although I'm not sure. I don't. I mean, it's definitely a holiday movie, um, and I think actually part of the reason so many people did watch it is it has been released. As, well, I mean, in Australia, certainly everyone just had a week off work. Yeah, and so they're sitting down with their families or whoever's in their household, yep. and they're going, we want to watch some trash oh, because he, we're sick th- of listening to Art Maver talk about whatever. Yeah, and here's a thriller with Sandra Bullock. Everyone likes Sandra Bullock. Yeah. Everyone um, went, sweet, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, and everyone did it. We mm. did it. Um, For those who haven't watched Bird Box yet, we will continue, though. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sandra Bullock. It's actually yes. got quite, uh, I mean, it's got an got a very good cast. John Malkovich, for God's sake. John Malkovich, Jackie Weaver's in there. Trivet- uh, who's an Australian actress who's more important to Australians. True. But she's been doing a lot of things since Animal Kingdom went big. Um, oh, she must be having so much fun in Hollywood. She just gets all these oh, awesome I, I roles. I dread to think the fun Jackie Weaver's having in Hollywood. <laughs> she has these really cool roles. Um, yeah, I, she's a great but there's actor. so many more roles coming up for older people because the only people who still pay money for box office tickets are very old. So... The, Hollywood is adjusting fast to that. And, you know, we need to tell stories about older people. It's got nothing to do with diversity. It's everything to do with the audience. Uh, So it's also got Trevent Rhodes from Moonlight, which is a movie we haven't seen, actually. Um, Daniela McDonald, who starred in Dumpling, that we reviewed a couple of weeks. Dumplin'. Dumplin', that we reviewed a couple of weeks ago. And a whole bunch of other people. Um, In fact, it's sort of almost like a cameo movie. There's a lot of... Recently, well, an actors have kind of come in and out of the the frame. Um, it might have been focus grouped together like that. Um, I mean, it's a beautifully made movie, but God, it's dumb. I mean, I just think okay. There's my two problems are it's <laughs> dumb and it's unoriginal, uh, and it's a um, horrendous stigmatization of mental mental illness. So, I mean, this is almost criminal defamation of the mentally unwell. 
It is. So just to give people some context, the plot is is that we've... Something has happened. It's, something's happened. It's the good place, but we've no, the, a quiet place. Quiet place, sorry, not the good place. Um, Don't confuse the good place. I'll show you, the producers <laughs> must have been really I assume that's why that. it, it ended up on Netflix, was that well, I reckon actually, they got into production. Um, apparently Universal bought it, so it's actually a book. Um, mm-hmm. It was based on a book by the same name by oh, wow. um, someone called Josh Malaman. Um, and Universal bought the novel, um, the rights to the novel years ago, and it just went undeveloped. And then it went on Except that. Because it's really dumb. And then it went on that blacklist that we spoke about a few um, episodes ago, which is basically a place where undeveloped scripts go, mm. and a lot of them get picked up and become quite big sort of films. Um, so that's that's what ha- that's how it sort of came to be. Um, but the plot is is that, it, and this is part of the major problem is you don't know what's happened, but some sort of it's never resolved spiritual monster could be aliens. It could be aliens. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Enters the world and. You can't look at them or they convince you to commit suicide. And it doesn't matter how sane or um, how much you want to live life, you will commit suicide once you see one of these things within about, what, 10 seconds? Yeah, uh, and which means, you know, in quite a, people will smash their, heads into, their own heads into walls if, uh, to kill themselves if need yeah. be. Um, so really unpleasant. Gruesome. There's a lot of gruesomeness on that front. Um, and so Sandra Bullock um, starts the film off pregnant and then has then lives basically in this po- post-apocalyptic world and this, the story is told through a series of flashbacks to before and early in the... Well, actually early in well, it's the... It's more flash-forwards, although it starts in the... It starts st- sort of starts three quarters of the way through the film and then it trundles slowly forward from there and keeps flashing yeah. back to bring you up to the point where the movie starts. So it's which an is not a great structure. But it's also just an unoriginal flashback, flash forward, which is pretty unoriginal in the post-apocalyptic just, genre. It just means your story's not very good in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. Because um, you create tension but through the un- exploring the unknown. That's basically what you're doing. Yes. Um, now, to my point about the mental health. So, well, yes, you talk about that because I know you've been dying to talk about that. So... The only people who don't die on seeing, or don't kill themselves on seeing the whatevers they are, the great unknowns, uh, are mentally unwell people who instead join in a conspiracy with the um, the great unknowns to force people to look at them and then kill themselves. So all the residents of the asylums are running loose, or what did they say? Well, actually used the, they, I think they use the word asylum, which mm, is sorry. not a word that is used Mental anymore. Mental health facility. <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, and there, there is a funny line where they say, oh, God, who gave them a day pass in this situation or hall pass in this situation? Um, but um, I, I actually, I'm not speaking as someone with any history of mental illness. Uh, I found that actually really offensive to make them the only visible villains in the piece. Yeah. And it's also it also makes absolutely no sense because why would this group of very diverse people with very diverse conditions, somehow be immune to this thing. I mean... Oh, oh, and then all in league with it. 50% <laughs> of the US is on bloody antidepressants, so really, well, I, most people should be surviving. I guess there's some sort of severity threshold going on there. Um, yeah, and then there's... I mean, should we talk about the Bird Box Challenge? Y- yeah, go for it. Well, it's been really upsetting um, disability I think groups. It's, I think it's an internet... Um, Beat up, or...? yeah. Yeah, Netflix has put out an official statement asking people not to do it. So it's basically where you try and do things blindfold, a la Bird Box, to see if you can. Uh, I also want to say, in the ongoing stupidness of Bird Box, um, if you've got a piece of gauze over your eyes so you can still make out shapes, you're immune to the things, although sometimes they'll whisper in your ears, and sometimes cars will bump into them and be shaken by them. So they do have a physical form, but when it suits the plot, um, you can just walk as long as you like, as long as you've got a flimsy piece of gauze over your eyes. Yeah, it's so dumb. And apparently, you just you just cover your house, your windows with these, like, with brown paper, and you're fine. Yeah, So yeah. I don't understand, like, it's... Well, unless they get one of the mentally unwell people to come and winkle you out. But even then, there was a scene where, oh, God, they're opening the garage door, I'm outside, I'll, I'll be dead. But then, no, he wasn't dead. But also, um, how didn't like how do all the telecommunication systems and everything get knocked down by this thing? Well, that's just the aftermath of everyone committing suicide recently. There's a lot but of that explosions. doesn't make any sense. There's a lot more explosions than there should have been. The electricity also stayed on a lot longer than it should have. Yes. 
yeah, um, there, there's so many things that didn't make an enormous amount of sense, although I'm sure some nerd somewhere can tell us some reason why it might have been possible. And this film just tries to take all these genres and just put them all together. Like, what is it? Is it a monster movie? Is it horror? Is it a post-apocalyptic survivalist movie? I don't know what this thing is, because it's of none thriller. of those things very done very well. No, nothing is done well. Yeah, in this, <laughs> it's it's quite the actors phenomenal. are basic. The actors are holding this thing up. Oh, the the actors all deliver their lines uh, very well um, and with a great deal of passion. Um, on on the acting front, it's extremely well delivered. It's beautifully shot. Everything about this is great, except the script. Mm. Um, which well, I think the idea actually, just the idea is stupid. I think the idea could have been delivered in a way that yeah, wasn't stupid. Right. But even then, it, I don't know, it was a pretty lousy premise, I reckon. Um, and, yeah, we won't spoil the um, absolute finale, I guess. But um, you just keep... Because this starts right off the bat. You know, she's she's trying to go down rapids blindfold with kids in the boat. Imaginally named boy and girl. <laughs> Um, so two kids in the boat, um, no one can look, um, trying to navigate down rapids in a rowboat. And there are numerous scenes where I've, I've done a little bit of rowing of dinghies, you know, where you've got to turn your back and, um, and pat, it's just no way. Yeah, it's not. They, they would, they would have flipped that boat, um, the first bend, um, and then the insane people would have prized their eyes open and made them look at the monsters. Yeah. And, um, and that would have been that. Um, possibly I- no less a satisfying movie though. I know, I'm sort of in two minds about what to rate it, right? Because I think this actually totally serves the purpose of, like, you just need, like, some post-Christmas, like, mind-numbing filler. Like, that's what you needed. Like, that's what I needed. I was tired. I, you know, you, everyone dealt with their families. They did all the things that they needed to do over Christmas. And then you just wanted to chill. And it, it fulfills that. Yes. But I think it's a really bad movie. So I think I have to give it two stars. I'm on exactly the same star rating. Two stars. It's too bad to be given um, more. And that is a pity because, as I say, it is technically an um, extremely well-made film with extremely fine performances from very good actors. So what's next? Death of Stalin. Mm, this is a complicated beastie, isn't it? It is. So uh, it's Armando Iannucci. Armando Iannucci. Um, who is famous for uh, Veep and The Thick of It, uh, which are two of the funniest, best-made shows about politics ever made, respectively, in um, the US and the UK. And this is set in Russia in the uh, 1960s. 50s. 50s, sorry. It's in 1953. Correct, sorry. Got my decade wrong on Stalin dying. And so it's basically... The title gives you the plot. Mm. Um, it's what happens when Stalin dies. Now, it's this thing was a really unusual route to the screen in that it was a French graphic novel, yeah. which was then converted into um, a movie. And in a way, I think that's a bit sad because they could have just gone back to the tape and done the actual history of the death of Stalin, which was a tumultuous period in and of itself. Yes. Uh, and the Russians are furious about the way the movie's been treated. It's illegal to show this movie in Russia. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, so I mean, I, look, I mean, so I'm I'm fumbling because I don't know how to say this in a way that's probably not offensive. But I found it a bit offensive that they all talk with either British or American accents. But I also think. Stalin's regime was horrible and should probably may be made fun of or at least, and critiqued, and that is one of the ways that they do that in this film. Yeah, I um, I think doing mock Russian accents of people speaking Russian is just as problematic as putting probably regional true. English accents on uh, on them. They did use the regional English accents to convey depth about characters that roughly did map. Um, so Stalin's funny um, Cockney accent, because um, he uh, historically spoke with a thick Georgian accent that intellectual Russians mocked him for. Um, Steve Buscemi with his um, 
um, American accent, um, which is just Steve Buscemi's accent, as far as I can tell. Um, it was kind of like an East Coast kind of high, bit, a bit, bit more highbrow, educated. Yeah, kind of. but but you know he's meant to be playing the key to Khrushchev, so yeah, and so yeah. that, so I, I mean it's it's made for a Western audience, but uh, effectively this is a English with Scottish actually, isn't he, Armando? But it's mm. a Scottish person telling Russian history to Western audience, yeah. and there's something somewhat problematic about that. Well, who else is going to tell us about Russian history? The Russians don't want to tell us. Well, we just... certainly don't want to watch Russian movies. I mean, okay, Nightwatch, Daywatch, they're all right, but... Uh... Well, it's going to have its own bias that, mm. you know, you've got to accept and acknowledge going in. Yes, um, indeed. Um, I did... I, I loved... There are a lot of flourishes in this. Once you know it comes from a graphic novel, you can be like, okay, this is just... They're recreating a storyboard straight off of a frame in the graphic novel. Um... When Georgi Zukov, who's one of the most magnificent characters in this film, and probably one of the most magnificent characters I've seen on film in ages, who was the hero of the Soviet Union in World War Two, he was the general who um, destroyed the German army, and um, you know it's twelve years later, um, and he's in semi-retirement, but he uh, Stalin's died, and he um, sort of stomps in and twirls his coat off and all the medals on his chest jangle and um, <laughs> and he sort of comes in as a white knight to save the day because before that everything's darker and darker and darker and the Beria who's in charge of the NKVD is um, tightening his control on power and, and killing lots of people. I mean, it's quite graphic in the number and frequency with which Beria was just dragging people away and shooting them. Yeah. Um, which has a lot of historical uh, backing too. That's not a dramatisation in any way. It do, I mean, I, once I found out it was from a graphic novel, I could sort of see it, but I think that kind of absurdist kind of style of humour that um, Armando. Armando is known for. I mean, there's like a bit early on in where Stalin's passed out, had his stroke, and he's urinated everywhere, and everyone keeps bending down to... Check give affection pulse. to him yeah. or check his pulse and they keep getting in the urine and finding it gross and it's just this I mean it's a really that is like to me what he's really known for that kind of and you keep, kind of keep laughing at it because it's so ridiculous that everyone's just mm. like sitting around in urine but they kind of can't go anywhere because they've got to stay there for their leader and it's just it's funny yeah um yeah so I think that like that and that really fast kind of snappy dialogue that he does in Veep and the Thick of It. Yeah. That's what you're getting in this film. Yeah. And sometimes it's a bit too fast, mm -hmm. especially for me, because I don't really know that much about Russian history. Mm. And I certainly don't know the names of all the people, like, the you know, the head of their internal KGB or whatever it was. Mm, NKVD. Yep. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even know that, Steve. Yeah. Like, off the top of my head. And... The guy who keeps ordering murders. That, that was your man. Yeah, but, yeah, so I'm like, so it took me a while to kind mm. of get up to, like, I found it a little frustrating early on. I'm like, who are these people? I don't mm -hmm. know who they are. And the, the quick flash of their role mm -hmm. on the screen was not Very enough. Very flash, yeah. Um, mm. But to be honest, the kind of story rolls along in a way that you kind of work out what everyone's doing. Yeah, I mean, there's a big villain, there's a um, there's a fool, um, then there's a bunch of little plotters, and then, boom, Zhukov arrives on the scene. Apparently, Zhukov's family have complained bitterly. They hate his depiction in this. And I've got to say, I've seen pictures of Georgi Zhukov. They make him ten times more handsome in this movie than he was in real life. And an absolute heroic, uh, epic heroic turn. Um, I, uh, I honestly can't imagine... I guess when your grandfather's the hero of the Soviet Union four times, you're used to a really um, uh, concentrated level of praise directed at his way, so something that falls short of that might be disappointing. Well, but... <laughs> no, they're all horrible. They're all really unlikable. They're either idiots, mm. murderers, mm. Um, conniving. Well, these are the people who rose to the Central Committee of the Soviet Union. Yeah, but like so all it's, of it's those... It's historically very accurate. But... Those car character... Flaws mm. are really amplified yeah, to the Veep... point of making them like two-dimensional characters. Yeah, but Veep did the same thing. Yeah, and that's like that he's doing this, but yeah, in this, but in a historically accurate context, like Veep and the thick of it aren't they're not real. No, but they certainly reflect the world. They do, but I know. think you get more 
um, lee- you got a lot more leeway. Well, you don't have family members screaming at you, exactly. I guess. Exactly. And you're yeah. not, um, you know, lying about mm. history. Uh, yeah. Lying about history gets to be a problematic and uh, tricky area. Um, I would say the gist of the history in this is acceptable within realms of dramatic license. It's nowhere near as bad as Black Klansman was. Um, yeah. I would say they definitely do compress the ending, and I would highly recommend just looking up the Wikipedia entry on um, Nikita Khrushchev um, to correct in your mind exactly what the timeline was at the at the end of this Um but uh, in general, I, I really enjoyed this. Now, this was a... Yeah, I really I liked it. And to be honest, if someone said, oh, I want you to watch a film about Russian history, I'd have been like, what ifs? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was, it's really good. Yeah, and it's an iTunes download. A very cheap one. It was only um, it was like $2 off the normal yeah. price. Uh, and you know what? I only went for 107 minutes. Well, which is what we want in a damn movie. That's what I want. I just want a nice <laughs> little punchy, like, after dinner snack. 107 is a little on the short side, actually. But God, it... I'm glad they edited it down. I would not have wanted to sit through another 20 minutes of this. They yeah. told the story and they but, got out. I mean, a lot happens. But yeah. That's because there's so much dialogue. and yeah. Um, yeah. So you do feel like you've... I don't think you could go for much longer than that. You'd get a bit tired. Mm. How many stars? I'm going to give it four stars. I'm going four and a half. Cool. If only for Georgi Zukov's grand entry, <laughs> which I just love so much. What's next? You. The show. Yeah, the show. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Now, we almost didn't watch this because the trailer on Netflix is so creepy. Yeah. And it does look... I mean, it definitely looks like it's marketing itself to a young female audience. Yeah. Um, And the first ten minutes is skin-crawlingly awful to watch. I I wouldn't say it's actually awful, but it's awful to watch. I think the first one to two episodes are actually pretty hard going. Yeah. So the first one or two episodes, it's a guy, um, Joe, Joe. Now I, a lot of people won't get this reference. Um, Sheridan doesn't, but if a lot of this felt like a recreation of a Paul Auster novel to me, um, which is these sort of deep tales of madness in New York and disassociation and alienation. Um, and, um, always yeah, creepy mentors and unsatisfying relationships. There's a lot of you in Paul Auster or Paul Auster and you. You may be looking at it a little bit too deeply given that Joe is played by Penn Badgley, who most people would know from being in Gossip Girl. And one of the other leading <sighs> a- actresses is from Pretty Little Liars. It does look a lot like Gossip Girl grown up. You're getting... That's there's, the vibe. There's a lot of Gossip Girl grown up that's going on That's the vibe. Here. But I, I do actually think it reaches for and achieves literary pretension. So Joe is a, works in a bookstore, so there are actually a lot of literary references. Yes, um, and he comes across um, Beck called Guinevere. Yeah, well, she's um, referred to as Beck. That's the name of the character. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, who's played by Elizabeth Lale, um, and he basically becomes obsessed with her and starts stalking her, and that's what the show's about. Yes. Um, the show's also about, and I think we can say this because it's in the trailer, as a, it gets very killy. Yeah. And I mean, they, they do get together, so there's an element of romance there. There's, there's, a, there's a significant element of romance. Um, I would say in almost every case, almost every case, not every case, the people Joe kills are really awful. And there is a sense in the audience where you're like, that person is so awful, I am glad Joe killed them. Yes. Well... He needs to retain some form of likability, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and the significant amount of stalking that he does mm-hmm. puts him right on that edge there. So There is, but then there's also, I mean, I think when it starts getting good is when um, Beck, in particular, stops being just an idealisation of Joe's and becomes a character in her own right who almost never lives up to Joe's idealisation of her. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think as a feminist... You got to suspend your feminist thoughts while watching this to a degree, because he's obviously a stalker, and feminists have to deal with stalkers. It, but I didn't want to show that glorifies stalkers. I don't think it glorifies him in the end, though, does it? No, but I for the it, first it does for the flirt first with it. two or three episodes, I was feeling very uncomfortable about enjoying the show. Mm. Um. 
And I just thought, it's okay, even feminists are allowed to watch trash TV every now and again. Yeah, look, I would also say there's a big thing in this where people keep looking down on Joe because he, oh God, he just works in a bookstore. Uh, I was looking at saying, hang on, Joe has a pretty nice apartment, albeit bad neighbours. Um, Joe has a very nice car in Manhattan. Um, Joe, is... Joe is pretty much running that bookstore. He's not a clerk in the bookstore. This is so unrealistic, though. There's no way that guy would have all that stuff in New York. And there's so many Well, other... they do have an implot explanation for why he has a lot of the things he has. Uh... True, but there's some other really stupid things, like... Social media, the, actually how they use social media in this is actually quite realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, in the, Very modern. Yep. You know, like people hate it, but they can't help themselves and they're looking on there and looking at what everyone's doing, but that's okay, but sometimes it's not okay. So this is all like really realistic. But then they do things like she doesn't have any curtains in her ground floor New York apartment. So like he's just watching her as everyone else having sex. Or walking around naked. Like, it's dumb. And also, there's no way she would have that much frontage in a student apartment. Uh, some of those, because it was a, supposedly a university-provided apartment for a TA, some of those universities do have some old legacy stuff. It was a really, uh, really nice apartment. Yeah, it would have had curtains, too. It would have. <laughs> and he, he's not having that car. Um, he's certainly not par- affording to park it anywhere in Manhattan, no. But, <laughs> I mean, I criticise this stuff, but... No one really expects. I would not watch this show if everyone was living in the shoebox that they would be living in in New York because that would take all of the glamour and all that, of the fun away from it. I think it. that could be an interesting show. I mean, Ms. Maisel was touching on that. And yeah, but that's doing that show. Ways. This isn't yeah. meant to be, like, trashy, like... Yeah. I'm meant to, like, want everything to look pretty. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there's some really... There's some unrealistic things in it. But there's, there's, there's just some really real elements of class warfare in there that I found quite affecting. Um, you know, when, again, people say, oh, he's just he's just a clerk. Why would you want to have anything to do with him? It's like, hey, he's, he's a guy. He's got a living. He's got an apartment. Why, why, would, why would you hold that against Probably him? Probably more him being the stalker that they want to hold against him. Well, they, none of them realise that. Mm, someone does. Uh, not really. She's the she's taken by surprise. Though. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say about this is um, it can be very tough going. Like we literally watched a three hour chunk on um, Saturday, and we had to stop because we'd just been done. But then about four hours later, we we really had to dive in to get to the end of it. Yeah, it's like um, it's like when you order a large meal from Hungry Jack's. You once you're halfway through oh, that God. large. You don't well, come back to a Hungry Jack's meal, do you? That's disgusting. <laughs> no, no, not going back to it, but if you watch three episodes in a row, you probably just should have watched two. Yeah. So you probably should have just ordered the small size meal yeah. and then enjoyed that and left it. But when you watch three in a row, it's like by the time you're through, halfway through that third episode, it's like you're halfway through that Hungry Jack's fries and you're like, I feel horrible and I want to die. But I would also say this, so A, you can only watch in about three episode chunks. You certainly are probably not going to enjoy watching more in a row, but you will want a few hours later to, to find out where the next thing's going. It's weirdly episodic in that in about three episode chunks, but not precisely, don't quote me on that, um, it'll res- resolve a story. Yeah, there's some satisfaction. There, 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 there appear moments where it'd be like, oh, they could just wrap up the whole series now. Well, they to be honest, the next I was episodes. actually a little bit disappointed that they, they insinuated at the end that there's going to be a next season. And I was they really did. The, I was just the, like, the, the cliffhanger was unnecessary. They could I'll just have be happy away. with this season. Like, mm. I don't need anything more. Mm. I would also say with Joe, he is not just, he's probably not even a conventional psychopath. It does show significant empathy. Uh, he does do nice things for people that serve no benefit to him whatsoever. In fact, he jeopardizes himself quite often um, he's just by an, doing. He's, he's an entitled white dude, John. <laughs> 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 well, you know, not all entitled white dudes. I'm not sure everyone's a monster the way he is. The other thing is, what was up with the um, incel working in the store with him? The only nice human being in the whole show. What's an incel? Involuntary celibate. He's not. He gets in a relationship. He does later in the show, but they make jokes about him being a virgin. And it's like, how does any man living in New York these days um, who doesn't want to be a virgin... Now, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't voluntary celibates in this world. 
But I think there's I nothing think wrong with the dude. If New- he wanted to hop on a dating app, he'd find someone who was into what he was throwing down. I think that in New York, there's just as likely to be lonely people as there are anywhere else. And lonely in fact, people, perhaps more so. Lonely people, definitely. But it's this idea of the forty-year-old virgin that uh, I don't think he was meant to be forty. Anyway, that, that seemed a little odd and old-fashioned. That felt like a hangover from an <laughs> earlier development script. Ian, Ian agrees with me. Maybe uh, she disagrees. Maybe she does. <laughs> All right, so what are you giving it? Oh, uh, I reckon <laughs> three and a half stars. I'm going to give it three stars, yeah, but I mm. don't do halves. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the uh, show. We um, thank you very much for listening to us all the way through. We hope we've um, shed some light on some of the shows you might want to uh, watch or that you have watched and just wanted to hear someone talk about because we do that too, don't we? Um, if you want to drop us a line and suggest a show we should watch, we're still waiting to get an email from you at gmtrpodcast at gmail.com or via comments on social media. And uh, that's all from me, and uh, good night. Thanks, Ben.